Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Biz News Finance Friday podcast. With me today, I've got Ian Beer, who is an independent financial advisor based in Cape Town, and he's an award-winning financial planner. And we've also got Malcolm Lobin, who is in Johannesburg, and Malcolm is an expert on global property investing, and in particular, investing in Portugal. And so he's going to tell us a bit about how to invest in property offshore and also possibly how to use property to get a visa. And um, so first, let's just have a brief uh, introduction to Ian Beer. Ian, would you like to tell us, what is your view on global investing? How do you advise your clients at this time when the JSE looks like it's not a good place to invest and South Africa is looking a bit scary? Uh, Jackie, I think, you know, with, with all of our clients and what's worked extremely well over time is to to make really rational and objective decisions about your finances. Um, and that's really important for us. And if you make good decisions and you go through a good process to make a good decision, then you're likely to improve the probability of an outcome. Um, our view, certainly on offshore, is we've always, through since 2001, since the first uh, offshore alliances were available, um, and, and not obviously at the the, 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 the the heights of the weak rand in early 2000s, but during the course of the ensuing years, we you know we slowly get uh, in, uh, got our clients to to actually physically externalise the appropriate amounts of uh, of offshore exposure, and that offshore exposure is important. And it's it's the, the level of offshore exposure sort of does differ a little bit between people, um, but I think it's absolutely critical. I mean, a key thing is that you get exposure to investment opportunities that just aren't available in our market. So there's certain um, there are certain companies and industries that are just are not represented here and uh, you need to obviously uh, get exposure to that and bearing in mind South Africa is only is less than one percent of the global economy um, you know you wouldn't go and get all your money and invest it in Chile for example not because it's a bad destination for any other reason but just it's a very very small country and you'd want to have a global exposure Great, thank you. And then Malcolm, would you like to just tell us briefly about how you've been helping South Africans externalize their assets over the last 18 months? Thank you, Jackie. I think um, a lot of our clients uh, following us into Portugal, which I'd like to talk about briefly, uh, already have had money offshore and were looking for a home which offered them a decent return and obviously a, a risk that they were happy to live with. So we, we got a great following based on a database of clients that have supported my partner, Johnny Ravi in South Africa over many years, followed us into Portugal. Uh, in addition to that, folks, uh, back to Ian's point, folks are looking to get some sort of balance to their portfolio and offshore exposure. We've been delighted to see them support us and come into, into our project uh, in, uh, in Lisbon, which um, is offering very interesting opportunities right now, given given the um, the conducive environment that Portugal offers investors in residential property at the moment. Thank you. And am I right in understanding that if you invest in Portugal, if you invest in a minimum amount, this also gives you access to an EU passport? Correct. And that's been an important consideration for some of our clients. I might just add that we probably sold about seven to eight hundred million rands worth of of uh, property to South Africans over the last 18 months. Most of those folks have, have uh, all of our, we would hope all of our clients have, have supported us based on the investment opportunity in the first, first and most important consideration. Probably about 25% of that 700 million has come from South Africans who are looking for that, that um, European passport, Jackie, and, uh, and Portugal, offers you a wonderfully uh, simple process of securing what many of our clients are calling plan B. You're not looking okay. to emigrate, you're not looking to go and live there, but actually you're taking a long-term view and, and, and securing a passport five years from now. Thank you. Before we get to the questions, and they are coming in, um, Ian, what is your view on this kind of plan B? Do you think it's a good idea for South Africans to consider buying property elsewhere with a view to getting uh, a passport? 
Uh, Jackie, I think that's, uh, that that is a very good idea. I think a lot of South Africans feel like you know they 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 short of options, and uh, uh, to actually have a plan B like this makes sense. And if if the property portfolio offshore fits into your overall plan, um, and uh, you can you can structure it appropriately, I think it's an excellent uh, idea to have a plan B, and it's, a, it's something that a number of uh, our clients also have been looking at, and uh, looking at various uh, options to get uh, uh, another another option in case they need that so I think uh, it certainly is a very good idea and we certainly encourage a high level of, of overseas exposure at the moment because if you just look at South Africa as a, an investment destination objectively as someone sitting um, uh, somewhere else in the world you know you might want an exposure here but you wouldn't want an overexposure. Right thank you well let's go to the first question the first question is from Helena and this is a question we get quite often and it's really getting down to the basics how do I actually invest directly offshore? What is the first step you need to take? So um, Ian, I wonder if you want to pick up on this one. Do you first need a bank account? Where do you actually start? Because there's the whole world to look at and you know, it, it can be quite an overwhelming uh, step to take. Sure. Well, look, uh, there, there's a, there, there are, of course, a whole bunch of options on, on investing offshore. But let's just take that as a question of, I want to actually get physical dollar access overseas so that's let's let's assume that that's now the question uh, so obviously if you want to go overseas there's a number of options to do to 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 get there i mean a very simple option is uh, one of the banks has a um has an app you can download the app you can register for the, with them uh, directly online you just photograph your fee and send it off and within 24 hours they register you and it gives you a little screen and you just hit the knob and you can buy dollars you can buy pounds, you can buy euros, you can buy whatever you want and it sits in your wallet overseas. So that's a very quick and simple way to actually get access to pounds and dollars. And if you want to, you can order a physical or a virtual card on which you can actually go and uh, spend the, the, that, that foreign currency. So that's a very quick and easy example of a way to, um, to physically buy the dollars. Now, Although South Africa has exchange controls, you've got to remember that the, the Reserve Bank allows you to go and purchase a million rand a year each in a foreign currency. So that means that a couple can have two million rand between them per year. So, you know, when one's talking at uh, people who are maybe savers and are raising their families, I don't find a lot of people that can afford two million rand a year's worth of after-tax money to invest overseas every year. So it's not that common. So essentially, you've got quite a big um, number that you can, you can send overseas without much paperwork at all. Uh, so that's very easy. That's one way of doing it. The other way, uh, Jack, is you can actually open an overseas bank account. So that's quite easy. There are some bank, the banks from overseas that are supported in South Africa with, a, with an office here to assist. They're not a branch. It's just an office to assist the opening of the account. And you then actually go to your bank and you ask them just to transfer um, the, the million rand overseas or any amount less than that. So that's another way of physically getting the, uh, the money out of the country. There are also a bunch of private client foreign exchange dealers that can assist you with any paperwork. In the event you want to invest more than a million overseas, you need to get SARS just to okay that your, 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 your taxes are all up to date. And they take about six weeks to issue a certificate with a whole pile of paperwork that needs to go to them. And then once the foreign exchange dealer has that certificate, uh, you can invest uh, up to 11 million uh, offshore. But once again, the, the, there is administration to do for that. So effectively, a South African couple uh, with all their ducks in a row can invest 22 million a year overseas. So we, we've got that functionality and it's, 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 it's very doable. Thank you. That sounds excellent. John wants to know, Ian, which bank are you referring to? I think that's a question okay. many of us would like to know. All right, no, that's fine. Uh, the, the app that I used, and in fact, I, I set it up because I was actually due to fly to China in March for a business trip and uh, to go and see some of the companies that our clients are invested in via some of the strategies. And of course, that was cancelled, uh, as you can imagine, um, it would be appropriate. So I'd, I'd gone to Standard Bank Shift and uh, um, just for ease of reference and ease of being able to get a, um, just to buy my foreign exchange. So I have a principle where in our travel, whereas I like to, if I've got a budget for the trip and I said it's gonna cost me X thousand Rand for, for expenses, I like to go and buy the foreign exchange early and then when I've budgeted the trip and then irrespective of what happens to the Rand between the time of booking the trip and the time of going on the trip, um, uh, I, I've already bought my foreign exchange and if it gets stronger, okay, it doesn't matter, I've already, 
budgeted and paid for it. And if it gets weaker, uh, it, I don't feel like, oh, this bit trip has got a whole lot more expensive suddenly. So that's a very good sort of uh, psychological tip to use for folks. And that's why I bought it. And uh, I unfortunately didn't get to use it, but I did transfer a thousand rands worth of dollars in there just to test it. And it worked very easily. Okay, thank you. Um, Malcolm, when it comes to property, what is the first step to taking uh, offshore? How, do you have to open a bank account? How do you actually get your money into a global property investment? There are various options. Uh, for those folks, many of our clients, as I said earlier, have already got money offshore, and uh, it's a very simple process. We, we, we transact with them, and, and they pay the money into our, into our um, system in Portugal. Um, for those folks, and I like what Ian's telling me, it, it, it's great to know that there's so many options about opening up a bank account. We have, exactly to his point, we have a close relationship with a, a bank in Portugal that's got a rep office here in Johannesburg. It's called Millennium Bank. And they, it's, it's a seamless, a very simple process. Within probably two weeks, they processed all the paperwork, all the FICA documentation's done, and their bank account is opened up in Portugal. So Thank getting back to your question, yeah, sorry, carry on. No, no, continue. Yeah, so so the first step obviously is to find the right opportunity to invest in. And then, you know, I think there's so many ways one can kickstart the process, which would normally be making sure you've got the funds available to, to commence with the acquisition of the underlying property. So this uh, brings us to Shaman's question, and uh, this webinar attendee would like to know, what is the minimum amount to open an offshore account? Is there a minimum, Ian? Uh, the, the, the banks will differ. So with Shift, as I said to you, I got a thousand rand and I went and bought sort of you know, $60. So that was, if you just want to buy a little bit of foreign exchange, that's a very easy way of doing it. And you can transfer it between currencies and people use that. You can, you know, when you're shopping, you might find some sort of overseas or uh, Singapore Chinese website that you're not sure about, you can order yourself a virtual card and use that card to, you can put some money into that card and use that card to, to, to order your goods from overseas um, <clears throat> if, you, if you're using it for that. If you're wanting a bank account, uh, uh, and, um, and I, I personally use Investec and, and uh, Standard Bank a la Man, my recommendation there is that Let's say you're looking at opportunity with Malcolm, but we're busy investigating and there's a new development coming on stream, but it's not ready yet. But you feel you want to now externalize your money because the RAND is now strengthening. Um, so then the right thing to do would be to get it into dollars. So I would then open an overseas bank account. So I would assume, Malcolm, we're talking, you know, maybe a million rand or more approximately uh, to get the money out. So I would open up a, an overseas bank account. Now, when you do that, I think if you've got an account that's actually available internationally, I'd always recommend to clients opening an offshore center bank account. So in other words, Isle of Man, Guernsey, Jersey, one of those offshore jurisdictions, because the minute you go to a onshore jurisdiction like Halifax Bank in the UK, you start diving into their tax regimes, their tax reporting, um, all kinds of complicated things. You know, I was told with my NatWest account that I needed to pop into the branch to just redo my signature. And the fact that I said I was in Cape Town, she'd never spoken to anyone from Cape Town before and didn't know what to do. So it's important to deal with a bank if you've got an international banking arrangement in, 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 in an offshore center, because they're used to dealing with people all over the world. And then once you establish that you actually want to now, you found the property, that's the one you're going to buy with Malcolm. Okay, then obviously a Portuguese bank is going to be important because you're going to obviously get rental income, you're going to have to pay a, a, a sort of accounts and what have you in Portugal. So then you'd go and open a mainland Portugal, Portugal account. So that you would do. So I do know with Standard Bank Isle of Man, I, I can't quote you the minimums, but you know, if you wanted to get 10,000 Rand and send it overseas, I believe you can open up simple call account with them. And also with uh, the, one of the private clients, uh, uh, phone exchange dealers, uh, um, uh, uh, one of them we use uh, in Compass, so we use uh, currency partners, there's a, there's, a, there's a range of them. And I certainly know in Compass have recently opened up an offshore banking arrangement where if you want to send currency, you can hold any currency you want, it's very minimal. I think the minimums are quite small, uh, maybe a thousand dollars or something and uh, you can then transact and you can actually pay that away anywhere in the world so uh, that's another option where there's a cheap multi-currency um, uh, solution for clients so the, the options really are quite wide that's great thanks and then Malcolm perhaps you can pick up on this question Maria would like to know can you please comment on an overseas bank should you be going for primarily US dollars or euros 
How do you choose your currency, in other words? I think I'd like Ian to answer that question. He's much more qualified than me. Okay. okay. So if, you, if you're going to buy one of Malcolm's properties, I would ask them for euros because uh, that property is going to be priced in euros. Um, if you're going to just hold the currency and then you're going to decide what to do with it, uh, depending on your leaning, my sense would be if you're not sure, go with a dollar account. Um, and uh, the reason for that is multi-faceted. Uh, the first reason is that the dollar is the biggest sort of traded currency outside of its own jurisdiction. So there's a lot of dollar price things going around. Then also, if you're going to go and buy any international uh, investments, a lot of the international mutual funds and investments are denominated in dollars. Okay? Okay, that doesn't mean that the money is invested in America when you buy that unit trust fund. Okay, it means that maybe a portion is invested in America, but what they do is they've got a dollar bank account and they bank all their new investment money in that dollar bank account and then they go and spread that money around the world. Now, when they do that, they're working with hundreds of millions of dollars and they get a much better exchange rate between the dollar and the pound and the euro and the yen and all the other currencies that you might be invested in. So, uh, uh, and a lot of those, those unit trusts have to report in one currency they've got to give you a unit price and then that unit price is often in dollars um, it doesn't mean to say you can't get sterling and euro ones um, but what they often do is they will do that in dollars so then you don't want to be going what you want to try and avoid is going from dollars to pounds and then back to euros and then from euros and redeeming that into a dollar bank account because every time you 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 go from one currency into another there is a small cost it's going to cost you maybe 0.5 percent and uh, if you're with an unscrupulous bank or dealer you'll pay up to three percent so uh, try and avoid the number of times you change currencies so it's almost the, the answer to the question is very much it depends where the money is going to go so in Malcolm's case if you're going to just park some money and you're waiting for the right opportunity I would go euros if you're looking at maybe global uh, investments then maybe uh, a, a bit of dollars is great and uh, you can also hold you know mostly dollars maybe 50 percent dollars and then 20 percent euros and 20 percent sterling if you want to you know um so you can spread it but i would certainly you know uh, have a higher dollar component great thanks that's a very comprehensive answer here's a question for malcolm from graham what happens regarding eu passport buying property in portugal if money is in a trust how does that work it's not a, it, it's not an insurmountable uh, uh, challenge uh, to the, the the question i guess the answer is simple um, in portugal uh, if you want to get an eu passport then clearly the investor and if i can just backtrack the, the requirement to get a, a passport in Portugal and most uh, most of these um, so-called visa golden visa type schemes, have, the applicant needs to be an individual, not a juristic person. Can't be a trust or a company. Must be the underlying applicant, which is an individual, and more often than not, his or her spouse and and perhaps even children. So the trust would then have to invest, make the money available to the individual. The money would flow from the trust into an individual's bank account in this case in in portugal and from there we would be uh, comply the individual will comply with the requirements of europe and in this case portugal to apply for a passport but the application itself must always be in the name of the individual who ultimately is is, is expecting to uh, to achieve a passport status in that country Thank you. And then, Ian, here's another one for you, a follow-up question on the issue of allowances. Maria would like to know, does the allowance of 1 million rand also apply to children? So how can you spread um, your allowance? Maria, uh, from, if my, my, my recollection serves me correctly, I think you've got to be 18 or older. So you can have 18 year old children that can use the million. So let's say you've got a family and they want to externalize money and they think, oh, can I use my, my, my kids? Yes, if they're over 18, you can. The thing you've got to remember is you can donate money. Yeah, there's a bit of a complication because if you, let's say for example, you did use an over 18 child to externalize some money so that you could get a bit more than a million out. Just remember, you cannot transfer dollars between residents. That is a foreign exchange exempt, uh, contravention. So if you're a resident of South Africa and you're going to send your million out, and let's say you, you're a single parent and you're going to use 500,000 uh, and send it out with your kids, your child's allowance, your 19-year-old's allowance, and then you transfer money from him to you once it gets overseas, that's a foreign exchange 
uh, contravention. So you need to be careful of that. Um, and uh, then with uh, kids under 18, uh, I don't think you can you can get an allowance. You have to use your uh, uh, million rand allowance, um, and uh, that's that's as far as I can from what I know. Thank you, Ian. Now we've got a question here from Harold who says that he doesn't particularly want to invest in properties, but he does actually want to invest in US stock markets, particularly tech stocks. Um, Ian, what is your suggestion there for getting started? What about a, the, the, the retail type brokerage? What, do you, what is your view on that? So uh, what I would suggest, unless you actually are a, a very disciplined, almost unemotional kind of person who can really just pull a spreadsheet out, do a whole bunch of analysis, make a call and actually dispassionately deploy your money, um, you're probably better off uh, um, buying uh, either a fund or a, an ETF. So if you, let's say you wanted a bit of an exposure to, uh, to US, um, uh, to the technology sector, then that would be quite easy. You could actually uh, uh, externalize your RANDs, go and go through your, your foreign exchange process, and you could put your money directly into an overseas um, share dealing service. So uh, it, there's a whole bunch of them uh, that, that offer these, these, these services. Uh, all, the, all the local banks offer them, and uh, there's a couple of overseas players that offer it, and you can go into that platform. And on that platform, you can buy what's called an exchange traded fund. And uh, uh, there you could either go and buy the FANG index, or you could buy the technology index in the United States, uh, or the S&P 500, which will be tech heavy. And uh, that would then give you the equity exposure at a very low cost. I mean, you're looking at at, at costs of about 15 to 20, but 0.15 to 0.2% per annum, plus whatever the custody fee on the platform is, uh, which is not 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 too high. So that will be a very inexpensive way to get the technology exposure. And uh, if you really want to do research and choose your own shares, which I don't think sitting here as your your spare job is a great idea. If you unless you're going to gamble a little bit, um, uh, I think going with an ETF is uh, is the safer route. Thank you very much. Now we've got another question from Michelle who asks: Is it appropriate to ask guests about a living annuity? And we've actually had quite a few questions coming up about living annuities. And the first one is from Arthur. Uh, who asks, um, what are the thoughts on the new blended living annuities that asset managers such as Alan Gray are offering through the use of a with profit annuity? That sounds like one for Ian to answer. Mm. Sure, um, uh, and I've I've got when I've answered this, I've actually got a question for Malcolm that I think is going to be very important for 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 the listeners to 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 be mindful of when they when they look at the property. But uh, well, look, I think you know we've spent quite a bit of time and we've done a pilot with Alan Gray on that on that living annuity and spent quite a bit of time with the actuaries uh, who run the living annuity products uh, that they they give you access to, and I certainly think it's got a it's got a place in 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 the right circumstances. And I think if if I can maybe explain it in in a way that might make sense to people, and I just give you because I think we need to get a complex thing and and try and make it simple. With our clients, when we sit with our clients and we're running an investment strategy that they're drawing on, we need their money to to last until at least a hundred, okay? Because let's assume the mandate is Ian, uh, this is how much money I've got. Um, please do a cash flow for me, and I would like to spend as much as possible, please, but I don't want to run out. That's the, let's assume that's the mandate, and that would be a reasonable mandate from, you know, 90% of your of your clients. And uh, so I need to make sure when I do my cash flow that the money will not run out before 100. And uh, then uh, they quite astutely say to me, but Ian, you know, the average life expectancy, I'm expected to die when I'm 87. That's what the actuaries tell us. If I look at the life tables, the actuarial tables, it tells me at 87. Why do you want my money to run to 100? Are you trying to make extra money out of me and keep my money for longer? And the answer is no. The answer is the average person dies at 87, but you may not be average. Okay, so um, what we do is if we go into a with profits annuity, now suddenly what we're doing is we're pooling your money, your capital, with 10,000 other people's capital. Now, suddenly, I can let your money run out at 87 because we've got a deal. And the deal is for the people that die before 87, we get to keep the, the, the remaining cash, the remaining uh, capital. And we use that capital to subsidize the people that live longer than 87. 
So now we can plan for the money to run out at exactly 87 and we've got cross subsidization. So the decision that the client makes is, am I prepared to give away the money, the cash, the capital that my kids would inherit if I died, okay, and swap that for guaranteed income for as long as I live? And as you start getting to your 80s and maybe you need some home care and you, you're looking and you want to try and maximize your income uh, uh, and where people are a little bit short on the amount of cash that they'd like to spend, that becomes an attractive option. Because remember, if, if you're 80 and I'm going to go and take that money to the, 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 the with profits annuity provider, they only need to like they, they've got to give you income for, for like seven years and then it can run out. So the, 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 the actual cash, the monthly income they can give you is quite substantial. Whereas I've got to make sure if they're 80, I've got to get that money to last for nearly 20 years. Um, and so I can't give them as high an income. And uh, so that starts becoming an attractive option. And we, once again, as a practice with all clients, because this job, a lot of clients come to us maybe with a question in their minds of can we predict the future? And if we can predict the future, we can tell them what to do and then they'll be okay. And the answer is that we can't predict the future. But what we can do is we can put you in a position that whatever the outcome is in the future, that you'll be okay. So that's why we don't go all or nothing with these life annuities. But as clients get older, I certainly think it's an option to swap inheritance that the kids could get in case they died early for guaranteed income for cash. And certainly where we've engaged our clients overseas children or their local children and said, hey kids, this is what we're going to do. We're going to get some you know, million rands worth of capital and we're going to swap it for income. And they've said, listen, please do that because we would rather, we would sleep better knowing that we're not going to have to subsidize mom and dad because the money's run out and they've overspent. We would rather not inherit, but know that they're okay. And uh, so that's for us the rational process we go through in terms of using them. So yes, I think it's something worth looking at, but not, you know, normally as you get over 70 onwards, that, that's generally a good time to look at it. Thank you. And then just speaking about inheritance, Christine asks Malcolm, are there inheritance or death taxes in Portugal that South Africans need to know about? Do you have any insights on that, Malcolm? Great question. Great question. The honor, the honor death tax in um, and that's been a, a certainly a, a major consideration for for our clients. Um, in fact, what what um, what happens on on death is what is legislated is that the asset goes to the surviving spouse, regardless of what's written in the into the will. And if there's no surviving spouse, then it gets evenly distributed to any surviving children. That's that's regardless of what the, what a, a will might spell out, but no state duty at all. And and on the question of tax, what's really attractive about Portugal is there is a double tax agreement between Portugal and and South Africa, which means that um, that one doesn't pay double tax. You do pay tax obviously in Portugal, and you claim that back when you submit your tax return as a tax resident in in, in this country. Thank you. And then here's another question from Douglas, and I think this one is for Ian. Uh, I've been investing in an RA for years. How and when do I get my RA money offshore? Okay. So I suppose many that's people a, have been putting money in every year into an RA and they can't touch it. Okay, that's a very good question. And I just wanted to touch quickly on Malcolm's last comment before I answered that. And that is just when you do go into the Portuguese property, you've got a mainland Portugal uh, arrangement. Do you have a discussion about the estates planning uh, on that uh, on that property? Because it's you know there, there are Portuguese laws that will actually dictate to you what you can do, and the South African stuff won't fully uh, apply. And then Jackie, uh, is my image running okay? I'm seeing Malcolm. Yes. Uh, uh, okay, so I just want to make sure it isn't my connection because I can change to another. Uh, source if I need to. Okay, let's mm -hmm. talk about the RA. You've been putting money into the RA. Well, basically, um, from the age of 55, and I like to regard an RA as a, an investment vehicle, and it's got a, a sort of, a, call it a hole in the top, and you can put money into it. It's designed to accumulate money over time, and uh, you earn interest income, dividend income, and everything in the RA, and the nice thing is that the dividend income, the interest income, is not taxed at all. So they do not deduct with uh, dividends withholding tax off the uh, um, of the income like they do in a unit trust and the interest it just accumulates without any taxes so it's quite nice you get that and also when you put money in you get uh, you get your tax back so in other words if you had a hundred rand spare in your back pocket and you put 
the 100 rand um, in, into the RA, it's only going to cost you 58 rand to invest 100 rand. So, so that's quite that's quite helpful. And for most people, trying to save for the long run is quite expensive and difficult to do. And 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 if we if we you know if they come and say I've got 100 rand, I can we can get them to actually do a 170 rand debit order. And then after the tax rebate, it only costs them 100 rand. So they're saving effectively 70% more. And that's the reason that uh, people use it. And our, in our practice, we don't have a, uh, we've got a rule. There's no musts. There's just choices and consequences. And we like to say you can use, sort of, for example, an offshore portfolio here or a unit trust uh, or an RA here. And these are the, the, and they've got the different consequences. The RA you can save 170 rand a month, and the unit trust you can save um, uh, you can save 100 rand a month. And then that's got its consequences that that flow from that. And we can model that. So with the RA, once you've done it, once you reach the age of 55, any time from 55, you can retire from that RA. And when you retire from that RA, you can have between naught and up to one third of that RA as, as you can cash it. You can ask them to put the money into your bank account. Okay, the two thirds, you need to do one of two things. A, invest the money in a living annuity. Okay, now the living annuity is ex almost exactly the same as an RA vehicle, except it's got a little hole in the bottom of the bucket. Okay, once you put the money in, it's in, and it's got a hole in the bottom of the bucket, and uh, that 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 money comes out into your bank account every month, and you can you can open the tap and close the tap on that little hole, and uh, the, the 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 tightest you can close it is where you draw two and a half percent per annum out of the out of the investment in that in that uh, vehicle, and the maximum you can open it is where you draw seventeen and a half percent out of that bucket per annum. So if we look at an average targeted return of say you know nine or ten percent, you know. Um, if you drew 9%, you're not going to get any inflation increases. So that's not going to work for you. If you drew 17%, your income is going to drop every year because you're going to start spending into your capital. And if you drew 3 or 4% per annum, then that would be probably a sustainable uh, inflation increasing income with your investment portfolio over time. So there's two other important, very important differentials. And I think we were talking about offshore investments and maybe clients, uh, there's a couple of people that are listening today that feel that when they, when they look at their offshore offshore exposure, it's very, very light and they've got properties and all kinds of things in South Africa and a big pension fund. And now how do I get more offshore exposure? Because I just haven't got the cash. And the answer is, well, if you really needed to get more offshore exposure, well, something uh, that people can do is, you know, if you've got a, like most people have a few retirement annuities that uh, they've had over different periods. And if you've got a retirement annuity that's just sitting there and you're over 55, you could actually retire from that retirement annuity. And you can transfer the retirement annuity. You could take your tax-free lump sum, um, your one-third, and uh, you can actually then physically send that offshore and buy some offshore ETFs or unit trusts. And then the balance you can put into a living annuity. Now, the living annuity, the difference, the only difference between the living, the tax is exactly the same between the two. But with a living annuity, you are allowed to invest that in 100% offshore funds. So whereas with a retirement annuity, the maximum you're allowed to invest in funds that are invested offshore is 30%. So uh, uh, that's that that's how you can access it. And if you needed to increase your offshore exposure, that's how you'd get it. Thank you. So this that's kind of ties in question. with Richard's question. Yes, Richard had asked, can, an, can a South African resident buy a life annuity from an offshore insurance company? So would this be a, an annuity that you buy from a South African company or offshore? Could it be both, Ian? Okay. Um, okay, remember, uh, when, you've, when you've gone and got your South African tax deduction, into your South African retirement annuity, uh, you've got to go into a South African living annuity or guaranteed life pension like we spoke about earlier, okay? Uh, uh, and the deal, that's a tax deal because you've got a tax break, you've got to buy a South African product. So effectively, it's always going to be denominated in rands in South Africa and that's it. But there, there's no, at the moment, there's no product that allows you to buy a guaranteed income for life in US dollars. So the only way you could secure that would be to to invest in the to get your pension and transfer the capital into a living annuity, and then to invest 100% of that living annuity in in uh, locally swapped uh, offshore investments. And uh, that's that that's you know that's then you could effectively secure a dollar income 
but you can't, there's no product that I'm aware of that you could, where you can buy a guaranteed do dollar income for life. Now, if you had cash money that you, uh, we spoke about earlier, you went and exchanged the rands into dollars into your offshore bank account, and then you approached a London insurer, AXA or someone and said, I want a life pension of you know, a thousand pounds a month and they would give you a quote and you'd write out your big check to them, you would then get your guaranteed thousand pounds a month into your bank account, but you'd have to do that with, um, uh, with cash. Thank you. And then here's a question from Shaman, also a, quite a practical question. Who do you get to draw up your will for offshore investments? And do you need somebody outside South Africa to draw up a will? And uh, Malcolm, is that an area that you are familiar with? I, I guess it's a question that your clients might ask you. I'm afraid I'm breaking. I'm, my question's not too good. Is it just me, Jackie? Can you see no, me? No, no, it's not good. Okay, don't worry. I'll ask Ian. Ian, drawing up the will, is that something South Africans should do or do we need to go to experts in the various jurisdictions? Okay, it depends. Uh, um, you know, we work with with attorneys uh, in South Africa and in Cape Town that have you know there's a, there's a quite a, a solid stomping ground between South Africa and uh, and the UK because of uh, um, historical reasons. There's also heavy heavy foot traffic between South Africa and Australia and New Zealand. So uh, there are likely there are pretty much attorneys in South Africa that will have an understanding of Australian and New Zealand and UK uh, affairs and are likely to be able to uh, assist you here but also if you're working through someone like Malcolm and Rabi uh, they they work with attorneys that assist with contracts and what have you and a lot of those attorneys will be South African and you might find because they've done 700 800 million rands with a business in Portugal they've, they've got correspondence and they've got expertise in terms of helping people uh, do that so I would think that where, where there's a, a, a South African support base uh, for something like that, you can get it done in RANDs. Um, I've had scenarios where I've had to get a, a complicated affair where I have, I've had to have sort of a London lawyer with a French lawyer uh, and the South African lawyer all talking together to try and get the global sort of uh, estate plan uh, uh, sorted out. So in some cases, you do need to engage with the with the specialist in that particular country. But uh, um, yeah, it does depend on the circumstances. Okay, thank you. Sounds very, I suppose the more assets you have, the more complex it gets. Um, Pete asks, and this is a question that, that was raised last week as well, and particularly in the light of the sudden uh, decision made by President Ramaphosa to turn off the um, alcohol taps. Uh, Pete Lowe asks, what is the probability that regulations can be passed which will outlaw asset swap vehicles in which LAs are invested? Uh, Ian, have you got any thoughts on that? It is a bit like crystal wall gazing, but you might have some insights on what you think is going to happen okay. there. So what I want to do is I want to talk about layers of the onion. Um, my, my wife was born in, in Zambia and lived in Zimbabwe before she came to university, which I, where I met, sort of met her after that. And, uh, you know, her, her, her parents had uh, lived in Zimbabwe. And unfortunately, you know, uh, or fortunately, they had their pension uh, um, invested in offshore pension trust. So they were, they were fine and were able to retire in South Africa quite easily. But all of their Zimbabwe money disappeared. And that's a story that many people have in the back of their minds. Um, um, and Jackie, so basically, um, what what you want to try and do is, uh, and I'm I'm sorry, I've actually I've I got into my little story, and I I've uh, forgotten your question. So am I still um, online? Yeah, okay. We've just lost uh, Malcolm. <laughs> yes, we've lost Malcolm as well. Okay, so basically. Uh, the probability of the government suddenly deciding okay. no more yep. asset swaps, okay. or maybe even actually we're not going to give you your uh, your annual allowance. But, you know, okay. because there's so, been such strange decisions lately, people are a bit nervous. Could the government suddenly okay. change its tune? Okay. So what will happen is there's there's a couple of things. Um, if you if you remember, there's 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 asset swap, which is a South African unit trust that buys uh, uh, and invests globally offshore. Um, and uh, what they've they've currently got a deal whereby an asset manager is allowed to get 40% of the total assets that they look after, and it's allowed to be directly offshore. That's their current arrangement. And in a retirement annuity, it's allowed to be 30%. So now that's where they are. So if you had a run on, and that's that's level one. Um, 
then level two is the living annuity is actually not governed by the Pensions Funds Act. It's actually governed by the Long-Term Insurance Act. So that's level two, where a living annuity, you can have 100% offshore if you want to. And then level three is that you've got your, your, your ability to go and buy direct dollars through your, your, the Reserve Bank and with your million rand allowance. Okay, so those are three levels. So what would happen is if there was a run on the rand and, and the authorities, for whatever reason, decided, well, we need to actually force people to buy more rands, which would help the exchange rate. Okay, they, the, first, the easiest thing to do is to change Regulation 28 or the Pension Funds Act and, 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 make the, the, and force pension managers to actually only have 20% offshore instead of 30%. So if you get the total pension fund book of X trillion and you times it by 10%, you'll say that's how many people, that's how much money is going to come flying into South Africa and they're going to be buying rands which will support our exchange rate. And uh, so that's, that'll be the first layer of the onion. And if you remember, if I remember correctly, when I started in the industry 20 years ago, the offshore limits on pension funds was 15%. And they used to tax the interest that you earned in your pension fund at 25%. So just, as, just just to give you an idea, and they slowly removed the tax on pension income within the pension fund itself, and uh, they increased the offshore limit, which now is at 30%. So they've really been going the other way for many years. In a way, it's good because when pensioners draw their money, when retirees draw their money, it's, it's got a lot of offshore support. And uh, so that's the first thing. That, then the next thing they'll do is actually tell the asset manager, hang on, your 40% that you're allowed to manage offshore, we're going to reduce that to 20%. So that means when you buy a unit trust that's in the offshore balanced fund, the manager will come to you and say, I'm sorry, uh, from the next debit order, we can't put it into that fund. That fund is now full. We've got no capacity left. You need to choose a different local fund to, 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 to save the money. So that's the next level. And then the third level will be the Zimbabwe scenario where they, they pass a law and they say, listen, sorry, this foreign exchange allowance, um, we've reduced it to 300,000 and there's no more investment allowance. Sorry, it's only if you've got to travel. Um, that would be a third step. And then maybe a fourth step would be what they did in Zimbabwe. Hi, it is hereby from tomorrow illegal for a resident to own any foreign exchange. So basically, if you own foreign exchange and you live here, you must repatriate it immediately. So that would be a dumb decision. And that's kind of the final scare moment where you actually get all your offshore assets and put it into an offshore pension or an offshore trust um, so that you actually don't own anything. Um, but those are the different levels. So we've got quite a lot of warning and all the signals that we've had over the last 20 years of, of all those offshore limits have been increasing. So uh, it doesn't mean to say we don't go through the the, the, the heavy paperwork to physically get the money offshore. But for our clients, if the money is invested offshore for as, as, as much as possible, I'd like that to be physically in dollars because it increases our choices and uh, gives us our options open and, and it also gives us cheaper solutions than, than we can get locally. Um, but yeah, that's that's the first step. So I think that I haven't seen any indications at this stage that they are actually going to reduce what you can invest offshore. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the, the prescribed assets is a separate question that may come up. It has come up. So would you like to just uh, sketch out your view on this prescribed assets uh, picture? Can you explain what it is for people who don't understand what it is? Okay. Um, well, let me maybe explain what it is. Uh, and, and let's go back to 1985, maybe. And uh, what happened was, you know, the 1980s, the government was busy with the Bush war, they needed a lot of uh, uh, taxable income. So let's explain for the older clients that may have been saving during those periods and bought their Sunlam RA, what would have been happening is, is, is in, in the early days of prescribed assets during the apartheid government, the requirement was you have to invest 50% of your pension fund in either shares or gold or gold miners, gold, okay? And the reason was if you bought gold, uh, that was great because uh, um, the, the gold miners used to pay a lot of tax. And if you bought government bonds, they would actually force you to lend them money at a, a rate lower than, um, uh, uh, than was commercially viable. So when I studied economics in 1980, uh, seven, um, the, 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 the inflation rate was 16% and the interest rate was 12%. So it was only country, the economics professor was very important, clear to say that South Africa is the only country in the world where it pays you to borrow and go and buy your car. And that was a function of, if, because if you force people to invest in bonds, then you can actually pay a lower interest rate. And uh, that's effectively what happened. And then the interest they paid you, they used to tax you in your RA. 
okay so at 25 percent. so just so that was the regime at the time and uh, uh, so that, that that was a prescribed and that basically helped support the government collect extra tax indirectly and get extra financing indirectly so if they needed money to, to borrow they just had these lenders coming in every month with money so that's that made things easy for them so what the the government's gone from there from 50 percent you have to buy in government bonds down to you can do whatever you want okay uh, with a maximum of 30 percent offshore and we're not taxing any of the income in that in, the, in that pension fund so that's it's been a complete reverse of that so it's it's significantly better so if they went into prescribed assets what prescribed assets would mean is if the if the government wants to do borrow money they normally just go to the open market they say hi we want to borrow 100 billion and and people come along and lend them the money it's not a problem so they haven't had to do it at the moment but if they want to borrow money and let's say people are genuinely prepared to lend them money at eight percent but they would like to borrow money at five percent okay people aren't going to queue to go and lend them that money so the way to try and borrow money at a lower rate is to force people to lend them money and then that's where prescribed assets would come in where they could actually say pension funds must put 10 percent with you know development bonds for example and we pay a five percent to lower interest rate and that that would be uh, that's not good because then what you're doing is you're actually forcing people to do it because actually what you're saying I have to pay you a low interest rate because this is a suboptimal project and it's unlikely to deliver a good yield for us. So that's not a good investment principle. It's not good corporate governance because um, where there's extra risk, there's extra return, and uh, uh, that's just overriding the system. And that would be not not a, not a, not a good signal. It's not a it's not a disaster from day one. It's not a quickly cut and run, but it's a, it's kind of very much a warning flag. That's a flag that, that Clem Santa talks about. And we, we, we watch for that flag as a, as a, a sort of a, a, a thing in the wrong direction. But we've always got to bear in mind where we came from. So, you know, any allocation to prescribed assets would be significantly um, uh, more better than it was 20 years ago. Great. Thank you for that detailed explanation. Now we're going to wrap up shortly, but the big question on uh, everybody's lips is always the value of the rand. And recently, the um, Economist put out its big Big Mac index, which suggested that the rand was 67% undervalued and therefore had some room for strengthening. So Gill asks, the consensus seems to be that the rand is undervalued. How does the panel view the rand? And by implication, is this a good or bad time to invest offshore now? Malcolm, what's your view on that? Should people time the rand? How, how do you deal with that? I suppose it's all about the context and, and the balance. Uh, I mean, who can forecast what's going to happen and the sentiments and the fundamentals? Try and predict the RAND has historically been such a volatile currency. And I think we're going into an era with all the challenges that we face. And, and Ian, again, is much more qualified to comment than me, where that volatility is only going to increase. And to try and predict where it's going is a problem. What's been interesting in our position is to just see South Africans generally wanting to get a greater offshore exposure, notwithstanding whether the RAND's trading at 20 to the euro or 16, which where it was. In fact, our clients, many of them invested with us 18 months ago at uh, 16 RAND to the euro. And look where we are today, a little bit better than we were a couple of weeks ago. Um, I think what's also important is, you know, it's just to try and, and leverage and get the right, the right balance from uh, and, and input from experts like Ian. In our case in Portugal, what make, has made it particularly interesting is the ability to leverage so that you can, getting back to that 2 million rand a year for you and your spouse, that secures you four times 8 million rand exposure because of the ability as South Africans to borrow 75% of purchase price. So effectively with 2 million rands, you can get an 8 million rand exposure in euros very quickly at unbelievably interesting uh, Price, the money is being priced at 1%. You can borrow money in Portugal right now at 1% fixed for 30 years. You can take out a 30 year loan at, at, at 1%. We're offering a guaranteed return for the first 24 months at 4% per annum. So clients are seeing more than just a currency issue, but also the yield, the favorable yield of a, of a, of a, of a 3% spread. So, you know, I think, I think one's got to look at those sort of considerations in addition to just the question of, of, of RAND and where the RAND's going, is what are the economic fundamentals offshore and how do they compare to South Africa? 
Thank you. And then, Ian, as we close off, I mean, there is a risk that if you go offshore now, you could actually look at your portfolio in a year's time and, and the RAND has strengthened and it looks like going offshore could be a bad decision. Um, what is your view on the RAND? And secondly, how do you mitigate against that? Um, I, I think the uh, the RAND is uh, is is undervalued, um, and uh, you know on the long term purchasing power, sort of a purchasing power parity scenario or inflation differential scenario, it should be maybe 13, 50, 14. Um, big Mac, there's, it depends on how you look at it. So that the big they did a Big Mac index number that was that was fine. Um, so yeah, it could it could be as uh, it could be 70%, but it's definitely very very uh, cheap for 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 dollar buyers at the moment. So it's not the you know if you've got a whole big rand check and that's all you've got right now, you know it's not it's not the right time to do a full externalization. But then again, there's a lot of what we call macro risks affecting South Africa, where the, the exchange rate could get worse for top down reasons as opposed to bottom up reasons. And uh, so what happens is you've got to look at, there's the real value of something. So the cost of rebuilding a house, for example, but then what prepare, people are prepared to pay for second hand houses. So what you want to do is you want your, your, your defensive interest bearing assets in South Africa, because we've got the highest, with some of the highest interest rates in the world. And and you want your growth oriented assets offshore and you want to be diversified and you also want to have a mix between liquid investments uh, that you can cash in easily and investments that are more fixed like what Malcolm offers so just just get that that it's about diversifying your liquidity diversifying your currency exposure and then um, uh, and you know to have excessive uh, offshore cash you know you're not getting a return on that so that's good to have in South Africa so just to the extent that that makes sense for your circumstances don't put all your eggs in one basket. Great. Well, thank you. That's a very good note to end off on. So thank you very much to Malcolm Lobin, who is a property entrepreneur, and he's told us about a very interesting property option in Portugal. Uh, and uh, Ian Beer, who is a, an independent financial advisor in Cape Town. Thank you to both of you for joining us, Stan. Thank, thank you to you everybody very. who's passed the questions our way and we'll see you this time next week and if you have any questions or suggestions or your question wasn't answered please just send me an email and we'll try and get that addressed next week so thank you very much Jackie thank you that's been super okay, thank you